precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Good morning, and welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church, Gallatin. My name is Candace Klein Howell, and we are delighted that you're worshiping with us virtually today. We hope that you will experience the joy of worship while you're with us. We are hopeful that this is the last Sunday that we will be virtually only at church. We will reopen the worship service next Sunday, January 23rd, to in-person worship. And we will mandate masks. Everyone who attends worship will be required to mask up. If you don't have a mask or you forgot to bring yours with you, we will be glad to furnish one for you. There are masks available at the ele near the elevator downstairs and upstairs near the sanctuary door. That also means that a return to small groups meeting inside the church and a return to Wednesday night programs. A week from this Wednesday, the 26th, the Wednesday night program will resume and we're going to be together learning about Diedrich Bonhoeffer. There's no book for you to read. There's Susan Johnson who has agreed to lead us in a conversation about Bonhoeffer and what he accomplished in the hopes that we might follow some of his examples. So on Wednesday, January 26th, please bring your own supper and join us for an interesting evening. And this Saturday, your session members will meet together here in the church building for their annual session retreat. Also, your giving envelopes are on the table outside the church office. They're in alphabetical order, so feel free to find your family's paperwork, the packets, and take them home with you. Now, as you share peace, we ask you to be safe out there and to wish one another Christ's peace as you call them on the phone or as you join them for a Zoom meeting. Share the peace of Christ with those whom you know and whom you love. May the peace of Christ be with you all and also with you.
We come this day, mighty God, as people in need of your steadfast love. With you, we find authentic life in your light, see light. We gather this day as people looking for signs to help us learn more. With you, we find grace. In your hope, we see never-ending hope. We worship this day, abundant God, as people who know Jesus as Lord. With you is the foundation of all joy. In your life, we see life. Would you please join in singing hymn 670, A Word of God Incarnate. We cannot claim ignorance of our sins, for we know how we have not lived in God, as God's people. But God refuses to forsake us, waiting to forgive us and call us as God's own. Please join me as we pray, using the words in the bulletin, then silently as we make our own personal confession to Almighty God. Let us pray. Holy Creator, we cannot remain silent but must speak of the ways we misuse your gifts. In our desire to have more, we cause further damage to your creation. In our fixation with ourselves, we have forsaken the lives of those around us. When we hoard the gifts and the blessings you have given us, we cannot be a blessing to other people. Forgive us, merciful God so we might be restored to the fullness of life you intended for us to know. May your steadfast love save and strengthen us to share our gifts with others, even as you have shared the gift of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. God delights in you so much that God will not rest until you are at peace. In the name of the Holy Child, we have been forgiven. God's steadfast love extends to the heavens and reaches down to touch our hearts. Thanks be to God who forgives and saves us. Amen.
Lord, by your spirit, allow us to hear your words, that we may know your truth and follow you with new resolve to work and to wait for the coming reign of Christ. Amen. The Old Testament, the Old Testament scripture reading is found in the book of Psalm, the Psalms, chapter 36, verses 5 through 9. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadows of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now if you'll please join again to sing the hymn 655, Come Away from Rush and Hurry. The Gospel text this morning comes from the Gospel of John. I read John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. John 2. Listen for God's word for you today. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now, Draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, although the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, 
everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. A familiar story, this is often referred to as the first miracle. We should remember that miracles that Jesus performed in the fourth gospel are never called miracles, but signs. In other words, the miracle itself is not really what we're supposed to see as miraculous as it is. And I realize that it's hard to hear this story and not focus on the water and the wine. But that's what I'm about to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to not see the water and not see the wine, but to notice something else in the text. There is an important detail in this first sign, this first act of Jesus' public ministry, and that detail is that his mother was present. Yes, you already knew that, but why is that important? It is with her urging that this whole plan was initiated. She was the one who noticed that the wedding hosts had run out of wine. And she was the one who made Jesus aware of it. Jesus' response was that they should have hired a better wedding planner, which is probably true. But without a moment's hesitation, she quickly told the servants to do whatever Jesus told them. To do. How did she know that this was the time for Jesus to step up, for Jesus to begin the revelation of who he is? I know that you've seen birds, probably in your backyard, who have little ones in the spring and feed them and take care of them and watch them as good parents do. And as the little ones get bigger, the mother bird begins to have expectations. Maybe she's tired. Maybe she's aware of how long the lessons are supposed to last. But whatever her understanding, the day arrives when the mother bird decides that it's time for her little ones to learn to fly. After all, a mother knows that's what they're supposed to do. And so we watch as the mother bird flies a short distance away and seems to call to her offspring to join her in a branch over there. Some of the little ones do that. Some don't. So the mother tries something else. She may sing to them. She may somehow communicate that she's having fun and they might join her. She may refuse to bring them any more food as an incentive to leave the nest. But almost invariably, there's one little bird that really, really doesn't want to leave. It's scary. He's never been out there before. He's not as courageous as his brothers and sisters are. And he just doesn't want to. And the mother will get into the nest and push him to the edge. And then she will push him out. Cruel? Not really necessary. 
And in that moment, when the little bird begins to fall to the earth, he has two choices. He can either continue to fall, which feels awful, and he doesn't like the ground, which seems to be coming closer and closer, or he can automatically begin to do what comes naturally, which is to flap his wings, and then he realizes, oh, look, I can fly. Of course, his mother knew that. His mother knew that he would not fall. His mother knew that he would be rewarded. His mother knew that it was time. And perhaps Jesus' mother knew the same. Jesus, at that moment, just didn't want to. He told her his hour had not yet come. But she knew better. You see, it's often the part of any mother's job to know when her children need to do something grown up. And she needs to know the right moment. Hers is not to frighten the child, nor to push them into something they're truly not ready for. Her job is to encourage the little one and to teach the child that she's right and they can. I also cannot help but remind listeners that Jesus had been living at home. His friends often came by and went out into the region with him. And he probably had learned a great deal about carpentry at home, as well as all about the scriptures and the Torah, as all little Jewish boys did. But you know what? Jesus was 30 years old. His mother may have been thinking, uh, it's long overdue, buddy. Get a job. I don't know that for certain. But hey, look around. So yes, I think the mother of Jesus bracketed his life and surrounded Jesus' earthly ministry. She was present not only at the start of his life, but also at the beginning of his career. And she was at Golgotha, where she watched him die. So what did Mary see that day, that day of the wedding? John has told us that it's the third day of the wedding banquet. Wedding banquets usually lasted a week, seven days. Three days means a lot of wine already consumed by a lot of people. Now, if it were us, we might whisper to some friends and ask them to go make a run to the local wine shop and pick up some more. But in this time, running out of wine too early wasn't a little embarrassing. It was a disaster. Wine wasn't just a social liquid. It's a sign of the harvest. It's a sign of God's abundance and joy. And it's a sign of good hospitality. And so, when they ran out of wine, they ran out of blessings. So she asked her son to act. She knew he could do this. She knew he was kind and it was the right thing to do for the family. She knew. So as we look at this experience, let me ask you, who are you in this story? Are you the capable, talent-infused guest who could do something but just doesn't wanna? Are you one of the workers at the wedding who are not responsible for what happens there because you're just wedding workers? Are you the wedding guest who expects a good time for the entire week because you were invited and they're supposed to entertain you and feed you for at least that long? Or are you the leader who gives out encouragement because you believe in your people 
and what they are capable of. Well, if you're the encourager, let me remind you, please, that timing is everything. Think they're ready when they're not, and the results for the guests could be bad. Think they're not ready, and they are, and the results could be bad for your people. Let me tell you a quick story that some of you have heard before, but it's relevant here. I am a person who entered seminary late in life. And the person who planted the idea in my head to attend seminary is a former pastor and a friend. When he first said out loud that I was supposed to go, my initial reaction was, what? What are you talking about? He told me why I might be successful there and also successful at a new career I would embark on and that he'd known it for a while. He tried to push me in that direction for several more weeks in several more conversations, but I didn't get it. Then he asked me to do a favor. He asked me if I trusted him. I assured him that I did. He asked me to call some people. He asked me to call people whom I love, and I know love me. He asked me to call some people whom I respect, and I know respect me. He asked me to call some people whom I'd known for a long time and tell them what he was recommending and ask them if I should do that. He said I should call five people or ten people, it didn't matter. But to call them and ask, knowing that I loved and respected those people and to hear their recommendation on whether or not I should sell my home, leave the city, travel alone, and enroll in a three-year master's degree program that would change my life. And so I did. And the answers I got were interesting. Most people said, oh, I thought you'd already been. Or, well, yes, you've always been involved with the church. Of course you should go. And of course you'll do well there. Or, you need some money? I'd be glad to contribute to the financial needs of a decision like that. Or, yes, well, yes, when do you start? The last person I called was my mother. Now, I still love my mother, even though she's been gone for, two, for a decade. She listened to what the pastor had said. She listened to what I thought it might mean. She listened all the way through. And then my mother said, well, dear, if that's what you'd like to do, then I think you should do it. You have spent a lot of time in and around the church. You certainly understand how churches and church people work, and you're smart. You can do graduate level work. You'll do fine, probably. And I thought to myself, there it is. That's the message I have been getting my whole life. You'll do fine, probably. A message like that, phrased like that, negates everything before the word probably. A message like that says you probably won't be the next Billy Graham. A message like that says, oh dear, she's likely to fall on her face. Now, I tell you that story not to put my mother down, nor to tell you that she was right or that she was wrong. I tell you that story to remind you that 
If you think of yourself as an encourager, it's vital that you understand timing. The mother bird must know when she can push her little chicks out of the nest and know that they won't fall to their death. A mother of the Messiah must know when he's ready to begin his reason for being here. Of course, Jesus' mother knew who he is. She'd been told by the angel Gabriel that he was coming and that she would be his mother. So she and Jesus both knew who he is. And she knew at the Cana wedding that his time was now. An encourager, whether they encourage family members or close friends, an encourager is a person who is vital to helping the people whom they love. Vital to helping people they love to become all that they were destined to become. An encourager is a wonderful and welcome person in everyone's life. And you can be an encourager at whatever level you want to any member of this church. Because your encouragement could allow that person and this church to grow into more than it presently is. But an encourager who uses passive aggressive language is not going to be successful. An encourager who pushes someone out of the nest too early will have to watch and to understand that they were not helpful. So if you're an encourager, or if you'd like to be an encourager, please be certain. Please recognize your power in that moment. Please encourage, but do not insist. Please encourage, but do not intimidate. Please encourage, but do not ridicule. Timing is everything. And you, whether you're the wedding worker, the wedding guest, or the encourager, have a purpose in this story of life. Mother, they're out of wine. Now, what are you going to do? My friends, you have heard the word proclaimed. You have sung God's word, and you have heard the ancient scriptures read aloud to you this morning. I now invite you to do something very Presbyterian, which is to affirm what it is that you believe based on what you've heard. Today, we use the words from the Confession of 1967, and I ask you, people of God, what do you believe? The church disperses to serve God wherever its members are, at work or play, in private or in the life of society. Their prayer and Bible study are part of the church's worship and theological reflection. Their witness is the church's evangelism. Their daily action in the world is the church in mission to the world. The quality of their relation to, with other persons is the measure of the church's fidelity. This we believe. Amen.
It is now my honor to go before the throne of mercy on behalf of all of us. Will you join me, please, as we approach Almighty God together? Let us pray. Glory to you, Almighty God, for you have sent your beloved Son that we might have new life in him. Glory to you, loving encourager, for knowing the right time and the best work that we are capable of. We lift to you the people of the world who continue to endure the effects of a COVID pandemic. We ask you to stay close to those who are feeling its effects right now and to be with health workers who are tired and overwhelmed by patients in their care. We ask you to give us wisdom to do what we can to help eliminate this pandemic. And if we have not yet received the vaccinations to keep it away, that you will infuse us with wisdom and with encouragement to do what is best for ourselves and for family and friends around us who could easily be infected by this most contagious variant. We pray, dear one, for our congregation and the people who lead and who serve here. We pray for members of the sitting session and we pray for their work and their service together. We pray for those who will ask others to serve beginning in the new year and we pray for those who will be asked. May they hear your voice calling them. We lift up our own loved ones as we pray for Norma Jones, Palmer Boland, Christy Boland, Jerry Sides, Sharon Sides, Fred Duffer, Laura Duffer, Juanita Fraser, Pat Hibbett, Anna Gasser, Francis Massey, Bellamy McGuire, Joe Armstrong, Kitty Armstrong, Kathy Cooper, Jean Farrell, and Bud Farrell. Please grant them your holy peace, O Lord. Please accept our prayers, both spoken and unspoken, and hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus himself taught to his own disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's sing together our closing hymn, number 669, Jesus, come, for we invite you.
God, go now into God's good world with a song in your heart. And may the Lord sing through you always. Go in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.